translate the slides that you have in the book um, on the CD are not the slides I'm going to be talking from. This is sort of a new and um, If you're one of those who likes to follow along on your own copy, they're on the web. Um, they'll stay on the web there, and they'll be on the Black Hat site a few days after the show, or a few days after DEF CON. My, my thinking here was really motivated by, by the story of Victor Lopez, who was an illegal immigrant from El Salvador. And Victor, Victor was a facilitator who helped people obtain ID. Um, and one of the people who he helped obtain ID for $100, uh, Virginia State ID, um, was a fellow named Ahmed Al-Gamdi. And he was one of the hijackers on September 11th. And this story, this story has really stuck with me because it's, it's a tragedy and it's really about Victor Lopez trying to help people chase the American dream, people who wanted to come to the United States, get a job, become part of society. And, so, and he ended up partially, or he's often accused of, end, of helping the hijackers do what they did. And so that's sort of the, one of the, one of the ideas that we're going to come back to. And he was convicted um, about two months later. He cried in court. He served a couple of months in jail and was then deported. And I, we're going to take that sort of as a starting point. Um, as we go into the talk, I'm going to talk about terrorism and security and ID cards and how those three things interact. Then I'm going to get into the economics of it. Um, and this is really going to um, connect very nicely if you were in Bruce Schneier's talk this morning. A lot of the things that he said um, play into this. Um, talk about ID cards and privacy, and then some recommendations and conclusions. Feel free to ask questions as I'm talking. Um, either shout them out or raise your hand, or save them to the end. It's up to you. One of, one of the things that, that comes up a lot as, as we talk about ID cards is people who have ID cards get in some way trusted. You're, you move from being an anonymous person who's clearly untrustworthy to someone who is trusted in some way. And there's, I think there's three important concepts which all use the word trust at their root. And when I trust you, it means I am willing to be vulnerable to you in some fashion. I'm willing to say, yeah, I trust you. Here's my wallet. I'm willing to say, I trust you. You can borrow my laptop to do your talk. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm borrowing a laptop. Mine broke the other day. Um, and Bruce is operating with a risk here that I will run off with his laptop after the talk. Um, trustworthy people, and I will demonstrate to Bruce that I'm in this group in just a few minutes, um, act to reward your trust. They, they don't take advantage of you. Um, and a trusted person is someone who's able to violate the system. A classic example of the difference between trustworthy and trusted is the fellow selling cipher cards to the Chinese in the airport is trusted but not trustworthy. They're inside your trust perimeter, but they are not trustworthy. They don't deserve to be there in some way. Um, informally, terrorism is the use of violence to intimidate, to advance political purposes, and we would like to be free of that. I think there's widespread, you know, motherhood and apple pie. Um, so how do we become free? We, we really have three security goals. We have a goal of intelligence. We want to know who out there doesn't like us sufficiently that they're going to think about taking action. We'd like to prevent what it is they try and do. Those are really the two main goals. No one really likes to be in a role of responding to a terrorist incident. It's, it's a failure of the first two that causes you to be in the third. And so I'd like to ask, I'd like to look at how, does in, how do ID cards 
interact with these goals? How do they interact with intelligence and prevention primarily? Because I think that's where we should focus our efforts. Um, so this, this is um, a quote from Linda Lewis, the president of the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. And all of, all of the quotes that I have in here, uh, if you actually download the presentation, the speaker's notes contain, contain the actual cite, citations to it. Um, Linda Lewis was talking about more secure driver's licenses, biometrics, as being the only way to stay a step ahead of the counterfeiters and help keep the nation's sky secure. Well, that's, that's a position which is being advocated by someone who's in a position to push her views on 50 state, um, the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. It's a group that, you know, your local DMV, they all come together at the AMVA. Um, they also have a Canadian presence, so it's 50 states plus Canada, um, where they, they do driver's license standards to, they, they share information, and they have been pushing pretty hard for more secure driver's licenses as a way to prevent terrorism. Uh, this, this is just another, another um, quote that I pulled as I was doing research for the talk. Um, and the, the, the core question you know, we already have a bunch of ID. Why not get something that's a little more robust? And then I love the second half of this. A card that really proves you, you are you would simplify transactions and prevent future applications from being hindered by suspicion. That's a fairly common claim, and I, I love just how succinctly it's put there, and we'll come back to it. Um, so, so going back to this morning, Bruce, Bruce Schneier's five, five steps for evaluating security mechanisms. Um, what problem does the security measure solve? How well does it solve the problem? What other, measure, what other problems does this measure create? Um, what are the costs of the measure? The, the first two, I think, are things that we don't, we don't often see people asking when they're talking about national IDs as a way to solve the terrorism problem. Um, and the first, so the first question of what problem does the security measure solve is something I'll talk about. How well does it solve the problem is something that I will talk about in the economic section of, of the talk. And then what other problems does the measure create and what are the costs are two things that I'm going to focus on as I talk about privacy. And then I hope by the end of the talk, my opinion on is it worth doing will be fairly obvious and I hope you will agree with me. Um, so w the first thing is it, it's important to acknowledge that strong constant identity checks may well make it harder for terrorists to travel and do, do things they'd like to do. It will, it may increase the quality of intelligence we have. Some of the interesting information that's come out since September 11th relates to the travel of various planners to Hamburg, Germany, to other places, and that intelligence post facto has been useful in unraveling some, in, some of their plots. It will definitely increase the quantity of data. Um, the phrase needle in a haystack really comes to mind because what we'll do is we will be creating tens, hundreds of data points about every single person out there through which we'll need to trawl to try and actually get intelligence information. Um, there's there's an issue. I, I think that the, the dragnet that this entails has constitutionality problems. That to say, we're going to stop people from going about their daily business um, and search them and record information about them has um, First Amendment issues with the right to travel, with the right to freely associate. It has Fourth Amendment issues with the right 
um, to be free of unreasonable or unwarranted searches. And I, I am hoping that the courts will, will address some of those issues. I believe it's misdirected energy. Um, we only have so many hours in the day. We only have so many policemen. We only have so many TSA officials. Those TSA officials are getting laid off. They hired more than they can afford to have. How is it that they should use their energy? What are the most effective ways that, that we can use the energy we have to fight this problem? Um, so is ID there? The, the list of known terrorists is really, really, really small. Um, and everyone who's on the list knows that they're on the list. David Nelson is a, has become sort of a poster child for people who shouldn't be on the list. Um, there are several hundred David Nelsons, and every time one of them travels, they run into enormous difficulty because the name David Nelson matches with the SoundX algorithm some name that's on the list. I've been unable to find out what name on the list actually matches David Nelson. If anyone has that information, I would be really curious. I'm sure your local David Nelsons would also be really curious. Um, but because David Nelson is harassed, are harassed, wherever they go, whenever they try and get on an airplane, on a bus, you can search the name David Nelson and you discover this. Just ask Google. If you're a terrorist and you're curious if your name is on the list, you can find out. So if you know that you, your name is on the list, well, that's good. It's time to get a new ID, perhaps. It's time to travel differently. But there are lots of unknown terrorists, and checking ID doesn't catch them. Uh, cause they're not on any list. Um, so we, we've, we've had a bunch of national crusades, and some people have compared the war on terror to the war on drugs, um, to the abortion debate. It's very contentious. And the, the thing that's really, really different about terrorism, and this is key to being able to succeed, is there's no demand curve for terrorism. I have never met anyone who says, Yes, I would like to be a victim of a terrorist attack. I know lots of people who say, yes, I would like to smoke something that the government doesn't want me to smoke. I would like to be able to get an abortion. There are people demanding these services, and that economic demand does not exist in the war on terror. Um, but going into the economics of ID make, make the war on terror actually a little more difficult. There's this enormous market, as any college student can tell you, for fake ID. Um, there's a market from foreign workers who are in the country illegally, and those markets were taken advantage of by the, by the September 11th hijackers. Going back to, to the AMVA, saying we need identity cards that are harder to forge is a fine first response to that issue. You say, OK, ID is easy to fake. Any kid can produce a new ID on their color laser printer, put, put some laminate on it, and they're done. So let's make the ID cards more secure. Let's use holograms and biometrics and online verification systems, and we'll prevent these people from creating fake IDs. But because the demand curve is there, the demand will shift to fraudulently issued IDs. And there are millions of people like Victor Lopez who are in a position to help someone get that new ID, which is a legitimate ID, fraudulently issued, but, you know, gosh, it's got those nice holograms on it and the microprintings and everything else, we're not actually making it any harder for the very motivated terrorist to go get himself a new identity. Um, 
this, this was just happened to be the first press release that I found talking about this problem. The state of New Jersey admits that 15 of its DMV employees are facing criminal charges um, between, in, over a course of about six months. Um, 15 DMV employees were arrested for helping people obtain fraudulent identification and dozens of others, I mean, dozens of others have been fired. Now, I'm not quite sure. I, I spent a little bit of time trying to find some detail on this and didn't. I wasn't sure how many fraudulent IDs you need to help people get before you go from the fire group to the criminal charges group. Um, you know, may, maybe it's one or two and gets you fired and five or six gets you, gets you criminal charges. Maybe it's 100 before you get criminal charges. But this, this is a fundamental economic issue. As we make it harder for people to create decent looking fake IDs, we get these DMV employees who realize that they're in a position to make a little easy money on the side and that little easy money, 99.999% of the people they are helping are people chasing the American dream, whether that's the American dream of binge drinking in college or the American dream of coming here and getting a job and raising your family. But because there are these legitimate uses for these IDs, people do not recoil in horror. If you told, I, I, you know, if you told any of these people, the person you are helping is going to use this ID to hijack a plane, they would probably turn themselves in rather than participate in that. They would say, okay, I am not going to do that. Um, I'll, I'll get punished. But they believe correctly that the people they are helping are not people who are all that bad. And this exists in every state in the union. It exists at the federal government level. I've got some more quotes. Um, the Department of Homeland Security last week issued an information bulletin. Um, this came out on the ISN mailing list. And DHS discovered that hundreds of official identification cards, badges, decals, uniforms, and license plates had gone missing. Um, and what, what was even better is they realized they had no historical baseline data. They have not been keeping track of how many official ID card forms have disappeared um, before this. There has been no systemic collection of information. So there might be a few hundred, there might be a few thousand um, various official federal ID cards gone missing. And again, all, all of the URLs for all of the sources are, are in the speaker notes. Um, so we, we ask ourselves, you know, you've got, you've got these ID cards that get used all the time. Um, you know, people ask to see your ID when you check into the hotel here. Um, they ask to see your ID sometimes when you use a credit card. Um, and it's the, these are really useful cards to have. Um, but the question is, do, are, are the people with these cards actually trustworthy? Or maybe they have one of these hundreds or thousands of ID cards that the New, New Jersey DMV or the Department of Homeland Security helped hand out. And so you, you look at the these ID cards being used as a form of validation and for trust, and you say, well, as I ask myself, is that a good idea? Um, again, so, again, when, when you have this economic situation, um, one, one response that you hear a lot, biometrics, we'll put holograms on them. It's America's most secure ID document. Um, we'll do online validation. This, this started about four years ago was the first time I ran into an online ID validator. Was going to a bar in Boston and what they did was they took your driver's license and they swiped it through a little card reader like a credit card reader. Um, that, 
in that information that you're entering a bar goes off to this company that buys lists of driver's licenses and offers to validate them for you. Pretty cool. The bar has an additional layer of verification um, that the ID that you're putting up is really real. And the bar also gets your name, home address, date of birth, and all sorts of other data about you, which they then use to market to you. Um, that's part of the deal that these online validators do. And the online validators get these enormous piles of information about where it is you go, what it is you do, um, which is very detailed. You know, your, your choice of drinking establishment, according to the marketers I know, says an awful lot about who you are. If I know that you're a regular at this bar, it's better than knowing your zip code. I can learn all sorts of stuff. Um, and so, as we get all of these things, we're just shifting the problem from cheap and easy fake ID to cheap and easy fraudulent ID. We're not actually creating a more secure infrastructure. So a, a little bit on, on the economics, or a little bit more on the economics. Um, Howard Schmidt used to be fond of pointing out that companies spend more on coffee than they do on information security. So the, the money that you spend on security is, is a fairly scarce resource. Why is it that companies spend money checking ID? Do they actually believe that those IDs are secure? Do they actually care if the ID is real? And the, the interesting reality is that usually they don't. Um, I have a Quebec driver's license. I live in Montreal. And if you look at this driver's license, you do not see the words date of birth anywhere. I have drunk all over the United States on a Quebec driver's license that does not show the date of birth in a way that is easily verifiable. Now, I can look at this ID, and the second batch of numbers in the middle, that 171266, is actually a birthday. Um, if you happen to know that, or if you happen to get lucky with a set of numbers that makes you look like you're over 21, bars will accept this. They accept it because there's a very simple economic question. Do we turn this guy away and not get his money and his friend's money? Or do we shrug and say, OK, foreign driver's license. He looks old enough. Let him drink. And I have never encountered anyone who has turned me away with my birthdayless ID. Oh, CBS News. You, you would hope that airports, that the airlines would be a little bit better you know, m just maybe wanting to actually validate those IDs if ID checking did anything more than prevent ticket resale. Um, what if, did everyone hear Bruce Schneier's talk this morning? Yes? No, no I, I see a couple of people shaking their head no. Um, he talked about uh, what the ID checks at airports really are, and they're a way to prevent you from reselling a non-refundable ticket. You buy a non-refundable ticket. Um, you can't use it for whatever reason. You just can't sell it to someone on the street. They fly as you. The reason the airlines check the ID is to try to prevent that particular attack. It's an economic issue for them. But once, once you have a fake ID in that name, they're happy to let you fly under that name. If they were actually using this as a security measure, one, one would hope that ticket agents would do more than pay little attention to the made-up name and address that were on the license. Um, so why does this keep happening? There, the, the, uh, the mathematician John Nash, subject of the movie A Beautiful Mind, did really cool work on game theory. And the work that he did on game theory was all about why do you have marketplaces where no one is happy? Classical economics says that you have a marketplace, people will trade with each other, 
And by the time they're all done trading with each other, everyone is happier than they were before. But that doesn't always work out. He showed that there are these situations where everyone is doing the completely rational thing and everyone is stuck in a situation that if you sit them down around a table, they'd say, yeah, I would like to be somewhere else. I don't want to be in this particular situation anymore. Checking ID when you enter a building is being done because everyone else is doing it. You try and enter a skyscraper in New York, they will check ID. Why? Nobody wants to be the first skyscraper in New York to quit checking IDs. They'll look bad. Even though we all know that it doesn't really add any security, that it slows things down enormously, they continue to engage in these behaviors because as the security manager for the building, I really don't want to say, let's not waste our time on that anymore. Because if something goes wrong, and industry best practice is that we check IDs as we're walking into buildings, and I am no longer conformant with industry best practice, um, I'm going to get fired for it. Whereas if I do the same silly thing that everyone else is doing, it's going, it's going to um, not really impact my job. I was talking to, to a friend who worked in a building that insisted on searching the bags of everyone entering the building for six months after 9-11. You, you could have a building ID pass, you could see them every day, and they would search your bag. And eventually, the companies got fed up with their employees wasting time. You know, this is beyond wasting time in traffic. Now you're just wasting time standing at the entrance to the building, waiting for the guards to be able to check your bags. And there, there was economic counter pressure that said, we cannot waste this much of our employees' time any longer. You need to stop. And so they stopped. They knew which side their bread was buttered on, and somebody else was there to take the blame. Um, so getting, in, getting into the privacy issues a little bit, uh, one, of, one of the things that makes the, the national ID infrastructure so damaging to privacy is that there's no cost to doing it. It is free to ask for ID. Everyone has ID these days. You need it to live. And because everyone has ID, you can go and start to accumulate a really detailed database of your customers. That's cool. Now you have all this information. Um, the, the company that has this data generally has no liability whatsoever if it's stolen. When, um, oh, who was it? There, so massive theft of social security numbers recently from some company's ID database, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola's employee database was hacked into and someone took an awful lot of personal information out of it. Um, putting Coca-Cola employees at risk of ID theft, um, at privacy risk, you know, their home addresses, their home phone numbers become available to people. And Coca-Cola is not liable they are not being held accountable for the damage that is or may be done to their employees' lives. All of those costs, instead of falling on the people, the companies, who are able to invest in security, those costs end up falling on you and I. And so the company says, well, sorry, uh, yes. The, the details of that have not been made public. What, what's been made public is that Coca-Cola sent letters to a lot of its employees telling them, we're very sorry. Um, but I haven't seen the details of who, who did it, have they been charged with anything, what the fallout is to those employees. Really?
So let, let me first disclaim that I am not a lawyer, but I do not know of any law which actually imposes liability on a company for failing to properly protect their employee data. Other than maybe GL Graham Leach Bliley may, may impose some of that if the data is being held for say payroll purposes or pension purposes, but Yeah, I was going to mention 1386 creates a requirement for notification. Does it create a liability for the company beyond notification? Okay. Um, did, did folks hear that? Paul was saying that SB 1386, um, which is a new California law that requires you to disclose if personal information about your customers is stolen from you. You have to disclose that information to them and it creates an unlimited civil liability on them, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay. So creative lawyers may be able to drive that up to spectacular amounts of money. One of the, one of the unfortunate things about ID theft is that 70% of its victims have no idea where their information was stolen from. Um, so we'll have to see what happens with that law, but it's new and interesting stuff. Did you have your hand up there? Um, do we do we have someone here who's? Yeah, uh, my recollection of the law is that unless the data is encrypted on disk, that that is pretty much the only defense. That inadvertent or not is not you know is not a defense there. Um, so. Sort of, sort of an interesting little bit of perversion is that you can look at ID cards and the government mandate that we all carry them as a subsidy for privacy invasion. I can't say no, I don't have an ID because the government mandates that I have an ID and it's then free to use that ID. It's easy for the companies to scan your driver's license and say, well, Here's, here's this database, and I'm, I'm enthused about laws like SB 1386 um, because I think that they start to rebalance the, the issue of do you want to collect this data, do you want to store this data by creating this liability if that data is then taken by someone else. Yes, Diane Feinstein has introduced a, an analog bill um, in the Senate to do exactly the same thing nationwide. And it's, as I understand, it's being lobbied against fairly furiously. Um, and it, it will be interesting, interesting to see. So, so because it's easy to get other people's personal information and because it's easy to, to go and get fraudulent ID, one thing that criminals have been doing lately is they'll get ID in other people's names. And Malcolm Byrd um, in Wisconsin had his identity stolen. And some crack dealer got a driver's license in his name. And whenever that other fellow, name of Malcolm Byrd, gets arrested, the police show up and arrest this father of two kids. Um, and so this sort of thing is actually happening 
more and more. Criminals hear about ID theft and say, hey, that's pretty neat. I can get away with my crimes scot-free. Someone else gets arrested for them, and I go get another ID. Um, Virginia has now started issuing passports, which are identity theft victim passports, with the idea that this has happened enough in Virginia, enough people have been arrested as the wrong person, that people like Malcolm Byrd can go to the Virginia DMV and get this very fancy document. Presumably it's going to be hard to forge and Virginia will have a, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Very fancy document that says the holder of this document is a victim of identity theft. Please try and make sure that they're the person you actually want to arrest before you arrest them. Um, the, first, the, the first ID thief who gets his hands on one of these is going to have a lot of fun. Um, and naturally, the Virginia DMV is free, absolutely free, of those evil people who will help you get your ID for a hundred bucks or so, um, or it's not. So, the, the economics around identity theft sort of ensure that the problem is going to get an awful lot worse. Companies can hold on to your private data and when they hold on to your private data, they have, except possibly in California, no liability for things that go wrong with that. Because they have no liability for it, they're sloppy. You know, we, many of us work in information security and we know how you go to your boss and you say, I'm really worried about this database. I think someone could break into it. You know, we're not, keep, we're not encrypting our backup tapes. Um, we've got this off-site storage. We've outsourced our entire infrastructure to someone else. And we've got all this personal data. And they're like, yeah, well, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen? It's not our problem. And the problem is going to get much worse. Arrest records are one bit. Um, another another cutting-edge sort of trend in identity theft is mortgage theft. What I'll do is I'll pick an elderly person who owns their house free and clear and steal their identity. I then go and get a line of credit against their entire house. I drain that line of credit into a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash and I burn the ID and walk away. This, this is happening with increasing frequency and to, to tie it back, the ease with which people are getting IDs, the many, many uses of IDs that make it easy for people to say, oh, I need an ID in this name, make this problem one that is not going to go away. As long as we continue to try and put more reliance on more secure, biometric, online validated, hologrammed ID cards, um, the value of those ID cards will shoot up. As the value of those ID cards shoots up, my willingness to pay someone 500 or 1,000 bucks to misread the name on a document, to, say, to not notice that the photocopy I have of this document is really poor quality, and just issue me an ID, you know, a thousand dollars is a lot of money for someone working as a civil servant at the DMV. The, there's a negative feedback loop which occurs where as the value of the card goes up, people's willingness to pay for that card also goes up. Your ability to rely on that card does not change. The cards are not going to become more secure because people will continue to buy them. So, some advice to, to businesses designing systems. Yeah.
Yes, yes. What, what Scott points out is that the ID card in itself is not becoming more valuable. What becomes more valuable is that people become more willing to rely on the card because they look at it and say, oh, this is a very secure document. I can trust it. Is that uh, accurate? <laughs> Um, so, I, I believe that with things um, like the California Disclosure Law, um, the Health Insurance Portability Protection Act, Gramm-Leach-Bliley, are actually starting to create liabilities. None of this has been tested in court to the best of my knowledge. It's all still relatively new laws or laws that have been around for six or seven years that are just now starting to go into effect because businesses needed time to adjust their systems. So I, I have not seen, excuse me, I have not seen anyone actually be sued for their sloppiness um, in, in handling of ID. But I think it's, it's useful to ask yourself as a business, what is it that we're really achieving by checking ID by recording ID as you're building a new system, is that the best use of your security dollars? You know, looking at this card and saying, well, you know, what does that card actually get me in this thing that I'm building? Um, the Department of Homeland Security, this is from the same press release, in, encourages everyone to check multiple forms of valid ID for each facility visitor. Okay, and to improve ID card technology. If it isn't working now, we'll work much harder. We'll, we'll run on the treadmill and, and hope to get better. And I think we need to take a different approach to this problem. Running faster when you're on a treadmill does not get you where you're going any faster. Stepping off of the treadmill, looking at other ways to achieve your goals, is really important and I, I hope to encourage all of you to to take that approach to new systems um, and as as you go to to executives ask them executives love this sort of stuff by the way when you're starting to talk dollars instead of you know exploit code and vulnerable systems and start talking about the economic impact of what you're doing, executives get this warm, fuzzy feeling because they think you understand them. Um, so ask, does this spending solve our security problems? Does it create problems for our employees? Are our employees at more risk because of this sort of thing? Use industry associations. Your, your employer probably belongs to an industry association that goes off and lobbies Washington for this and that. Um, maybe they have things before them which have ID card issues. And you can say, you know, we're going to spend an enormous amount of energy checking these ID cards, but the DMVs are issuing fake IDs for $100. They issue fraudulent IDs. So we spend all this energy, you know, check the microprint, check the hologram, make a photocopy, stick it in a database, accept this liability, how does that make us more secure? How does that protect us as a company against the problems that we really want to worry about? How does it make our customers any happier to have to go through this rigmarole? Um, so some advice if you, if you work in government. I, I understand we have a whole bunch of government employees here. Everyone checking IDs means that these IDs become valuable, that issuance fraud goes up, and you can't rely on your own ID cards when you need to. You're spending money checking up and making sure that these ID cards, the people you're issuing the cards to, are the right people. And all of a sudden, everyone else trying to freeload on you has created this situation where you can't rely on your own card because your own employees are selling them out the back door. It's, 
it's a problem if you want to rely on your card and you can't do it because everyone else is also relying on your card. Um, and as, as you look at ID cards and terrorists, you know, people actually who want to do bad things to us, a terrorist is really, really motivated to know if their name is in the database. Really, you know, that's, that's if their job is to create mayhem and havoc, one, one question that they will ask is, how am I going to get caught? We've seen, if, if you pay attention to Homeland Security bulletins, they talk about terrorist methodologies. They scope out buildings before they attack them. They will photograph them. They will videotape the activities of security personnel. Um, because they want to understand what's going to happen when they actually go to carry out their attack. Seems, seems like a logical approach. They are also going to go and say, okay, who is going to carry out this attack? If the guard at the gate checks ID, they're going to find that out very quickly and very easily, and they're going to get themselves a different ID card. So the, the people who you most want to catch, the people who we would all like to catch and prevent from carrying out these attacks are motivated to know that they're on the list and they are motivated to do something about it because everyone else also needs new ID. It is easy for them to slip through the system. We, the the widespread checking of ID reduces the security of those ID systems where we'd really like them to be. Um, this, this came out a week or so ago. And, you know, we've let our screeners know that they need to safeguard their personal information, says uh, TSA spokeswoman Chris Radigan. Does that mean not giving it to you? I mean, you demanded this information as a condition of those screeners getting a job. They put those screeners through background checks. Try showing up and saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about my privacy. I would prefer you not do a background check and you not get my social security number or date of birth. And you won't have a job. So what is it, what is meant by the phrase, we've let our screeners know they need to safeguard their personal information? Could you make that actionable for me? What exactly should I do here? Um, it's, I, I'd really like to encourage people when, when you hear these things to, to challenge them, to say, well, what do you mean? How can we, how am I supposed to do that? Um, because I believe there's a lot of unfortunately poor thinking around these issues. She got away with saying that in front of a room of reasonably smart, skeptical reporters. Um, Sure. So let, let me try and summarize your point and then respond to it. Um, you're, you're asking or, or pointing out that just because something is hard, we don't, we don't avoid that. You know, the, the fact that it's e 
putting a hologram on an ID card makes it more valuable doesn't mean that we also don't have some security gain. Is that a reasonable? Oh, so uh, I agree with you in, in that it makes sense to apply security measures to things that, that are valuable. It, it's, Mm -hmm. that we shouldn't worry about making our ID card so that it doesn't happen. So what I'm saying is, that's what I'm okay. saying, right? We should make the ID harder to get. But the problem is not that it's more valuable. The problem is we have to then address what we do to prevent people from giving out IDs. Uh, that's a, they're separate issues. Well, they're, they're not, though. They're, the, the issue of the ID becoming more valuable inherently makes it harder to prevent people from getting the new ID. Be and it's, when I look at a security measure and say, how much reliance do I want to put on this ID, right? When you checked into the hotel, they checked your ID. Um, what, what is the benefit to the hotel of checking the ID versus the potential cost? And I believe that there is a large, there are two large societal costs to regular checking of ID. One of which is the privacy risk, where this information is now in Caesar's database. Um, and honestly, I believe Caesar's probably protects it pretty well because they don't want their competitors hacking in and taking their lists of high rollers. Um, the second risk is that it becomes easy for folks to go and acquire these ID cards, which we might like to rely on, on in high security situations. And so if we take a look and eliminate some of the many ID checks that happen regularly, we may be able to increase the security of the system as a whole because we're being more careful about when and where we're choosing to use the ID we're reducing some of the, by reducing the ancillary values that people get. You know, if I don't need ID to drink, that's going to dry up a major source of motivation for people to get new ID. And so I think that we need to ask as a society, um, what's the impact, what is the impact of these laws? What is the impact of regular checking of ID because I believe that the situation we're in is seriously suboptimal. And I believe there are better situations which take advantage of more secure ID or even the IDs we have today to achieve security goals. And I think that those goals are made harder. It becomes more difficult to reach them because of all these ancillary uses. Um, sh if more <laughs> right Right. It's, there's, there's actually a really interesting set of laws in Germany on this where it, in Germany it is illegal to enter your national ID number into a data processing system of any sort. And there's very specific regulations concerning when you can ask to see the national ID card at all. So I believe that I, there are laws that might work that would help this situation.
Yeah, the, the question of who owns the data is, is a really interesting one. And in fact, Oregon passed a law and then repealed it two years later saying you own your own genetic data. That was in 1999. They repealed it in 2001. It was the only. <laughs> it, it was the only time I know that any that the United States has had a law that says you own per, your own personal data, and that's a it's a really good point. And there's a whole set of things that we can talk about, but we've got a whole bunch of questions here. The, the okay, let, let me take the second and third. The question of a law that says an ID that the government issues can only be used by the government. Uh, some of the conversations I've had as I've talked about these ideas, I've, I've suggested that. I've been told that that is very hard to achieve in the United States' legal tradition to forbid the use of information um, that's a public record in some fashion would just be very challenging. And your, your third question, I'm sorry? Oh, a privatized ID system. Right, um, privatized ID companies. I think it's a very hard thing for a private company to step into. Um, if you think about the PKI market, the model that VeriSign started with in like 1996 or 97 was exactly that, that they were going to issue you an ID, the internet driver's license marketing tag, um, and that would allow a private infrastructure. I think that without the fallback on some sort of legal penalty for lying to that company. Um, no one really wants to rely on the assurances that that company makes. And also, we've got this free infrastructure over here, and it's really hard to compete with free. Even. Yeah, it's that whole Nash equilibria thing comes and bites you again. Not to be used for identify. Well, I've, I've got IDs for a lot of different functions. Um, and I think that concentrating all the functions on a single card, it, it just hits that whole negative feedback loop, that that card will become so valuable and so abusable that it doesn't become any more trustworthy. It just becomes more trusted. I, 
I, I think concentration in and of itself is a problem. It's the big fat target issue that you run into in information security. You put everything in one place and everyone wants to be there. Yeah, I, I made no claim that this was a technology talk. I'm going to disagree with you there. I think that the, the enrollment stage comes under, a more secure enrollment stage simply increases the, how valuable it is to subvert those trusted employees who are running that stage. And trying, trying to add a technological solution of a more secure birth certificate, um, Right, and so investing in all that technology is really cool, and as a security vendor, sometimes I say, hey, it would be nice to have um, the government paying for all of this. I don't really like the result either. Right, so would um, so um, the, the question of will college students go to bribe DMV officials as a means to be able to drink, um, I don't know if they will go quite that far themselves. However, I do know that what's happened in every state as they introduce more secure holographic um, microprinted cards is that the supplies to make those cards are stolen and the quality of the ID card of the fake IDs just keeps going up. And what what I believe will happen next, at, if we actually get to cards that really, really are hard to forge, there will be facilitators, people like Victor Lopez, who will introduce you to the DMV official who will take your money. Um, because yeah, pe people spend a couple hundred dollars on a fake ID. Um, they'll continue to spend that money um, because they want to be able to engage in that activity. I don't believe that, that at the end of the day, the, the, iron, the iron fist approach beats economics. I, I think that the economics will, will win out unless, you know, maybe the death penalty for fraudulent ID, but I think that would be wrong. This, this, I'm sorry, this gent has had his hand up for a while and then you. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really, really good point. Thank you.
So let me just repeat some of what you said for, for the tape because I think it's really good points that in the UK they've scrapped their ID system after the Second World War, that the United States tends to go and pursue technological solutions to human problems, um, and we should invest in training our screeners to look at the person, not the ID card. And th thank you for stating all of that because they're, they're great points which I tried to allude to but you, you felt the need to bring them up, so I didn't state them nearly as clearly as you did. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, once, once your biometric is associated with the wrong person in the database, well, just go and steal someone else's ID at that point. <laughs> Well, m yes, and I, I, I think I did talk about that a little bit at the beginning, that there are other uses of ID rather than stopping them from blowing up the plane. Did you? Yeah, the, the, the comment about, well, actually there's a whole bunch of comments, so rather than responding to each one, I want to let other people add their was uh, mandatory by law. You can be get arrested for if you do not have an ID in Italy. Where? where? In Italy. In Italy, okay. Yeah. And this happened 20 years ago, more or less, and it's still a law. But terrorists didn't uh, uh, stop acting, or they did stop acting, not for this reason. It didn't change anything on, on this way. We have a mandatory ID, and we always have one, but didn't change anything about terrorists, even if this law was uh, introduced to fight terrorism. Yeah. There's a gentleman back there, Paul. Yeah, back there. That. Uh, 
a comment on the gentleman over here in the white shirt. Um, number one, I think it was a very good one. I just kind of wanted to comment maybe on why um, America is fixed on these technological solutions to is what you are populating as a human problem. Um, I would suggest that maybe that has something to do with our willingness to admit that it is a human problem and that we can't just fix it through American innovation or American smart. This, this is not, you know, this is not an attitudinal issue. You know, it's not a problem with us, right? We're perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think part of the problem is that uh, people underestimate the value of their own personal information. And as a result, they're too willing to give it up. And they don't question why people need it and demand in some cases that they not uh, be able to give it in order to do a transaction of some sort. I, I think that's sometimes true. As someone who is very concerned about privacy issues and very willing to challenge a request for ID, Paul, if you want to bring the mic to that jump back there. Very willing to challenge requests for ID all over the place. It has become increasingly difficult in the United States. My old excuse was I don't have one. Um, and it used to be that saying I don't have an ID was a really effective way to circumvent the question of can I see your ID. Um, because it has become essentially mandated for so many aspects of life, people look at you incredulously, whereas five years ago they didn't. So I think that's, it's, it, it's just not as easy as I would like to say no. Okay. So I'm still kind of curious, what exactly do you believe the solution to this problem is? That, that's a good question. Um, I, I believe the solution is to understand the economic drivers that make it, that make pushing more and more ID insufficient to actually get more and more secure ID. And that, that's one section of the solution. The second section of the solution is to recognize that because it is so difficult to actually obtain an ID system that will do some of the things that people claim it will do, we ought to be focusing our security efforts on other areas than ID cards. Um, as this gentleman said, better screeners, better analysis, um, better doors for the airplanes. Um, rather than focus on the ID card, as a panacea or as a solution because I believe that the ID card is unlikely to actually catch the right people. Even if we had a list of the right people, um, they would go out and get different IDs possibly from other countries because they are so motivated to do that. And so the right solution is to focus on better uses of our resources in the security systems that we build. I can understand the point that the ability to trust our humans is not always there. But to bring up what Dario talked about yesterday, almost all of the people who were recently arrested in the European case who were hackers were white hat hackers by day and who were trusted inside of the system. and they had no way of knowing that these same people were actually, you know, breaking into government systems and selling this information to organized crime groups. So how can we know that we have a level of trust in our trusted employee base? How can we ever get to that point where I can say definitively that the people who work for me in my company can be trusted? Because I know I can't right now. I don't believe that you can ever reach a point where you can definitively say, I trust Aldrich Ames or I trust Kim Philby. Organizations, um, Aldrich Ames being a CIA employee who was also working for the KGB, Kim Philby being one of the Cambridge Five, um, organizations that are very, very dedicated to solving that problem fail. And 
it's, it's a matter of risk management, not risk elimination. I don't believe you will ever be in a situation where you can absolutely 100% trust any other human being, however much energy you put in. People cheat on their spouses, right? You, you have to accept some degree of risk, as uncomfortable as that can be. Um, I think that w a lot of these things that we've been talking about here actually come down to fundamentally social problems. Um, and I think that more than any technical fix or um, you know, training any individual um, group of people, be they screeners, be they flight attendants, be they police officers, I think what really actually has to change is more the attitude of individual of, of people vis-a-vis you know, -vis other people. If you look at very secure organizations, they tend to encourage a culture where everybody um, not, if you like, spies on everybody else. It's interesting that, in fact, the East German um, Stasi system, which you know we all quite cheerfully despise and for good reason, um, but encouraged a culture where everyone was quite literally looking over everybody else's shoulder. And I think that it's actually much more important that we actually start looking at our societies and say, well, how do we relate to each other in order to establish trust? Um, is it a case of, do we go for something that looks like a web of trust model where, you know, I know you and you know me and then, you know, we mutually trust somebody else and, you know, and do we base it on sort of social networks or do we look for technological fixes or do we do something else altogether? But unless we ask these really difficult, um, very deep fundamental social questions about how exactly do we, you know, do we want our societies to work? You know, forever we're going to be grasping for, you know, either the quick fix like the ID card, which plainly doesn't work, or alternatively living in a state where we're not really, you know, terribly sure, you know, what exactly we should do. And I, th I suspect that the answers to these uh, questions are going to be extreme, and the process of getting them will be extremely uncomfortable. And here is probably not the right place to do it, but it's a debate that needs to happen in society more generally. I'll shut up now. <laughs> When terror, mentioning terrorism is an excellent way to attempt to get things done, get your agenda pushed, but, uh, but uh, all, all of the measures, I, I think, are, don't have anything to do with terrorism. Um, and, and, and it could be that, that the measures, the, the real motivations behind the increased security and, and, and the identification will actually address the concerns that, that motivated the people to want to make these changes in the first place. So I, I guess I'm proposing it that this may actually solve a problem, but it doesn't solve the terrorism problem, and, and, and what problem it is, yeah. I one, don't know. One last comment from the woman behind you. Who's had a hand up for a little while. That's okay, because I want to say what he said about oh. the Italian ID, that it's not a real problem, because you're gonna use uh, people that uh, has an ID that has, doesn't have any connection with the terrorism, even if that's the terrorist who's gonna kill you. And it's a fake problem because the security about terrorism, it's completely different because I can have a totally legitimate ID, go in the plane and do whatever I have to do. So I guess the, the, there is the need to address the issue of security in a completely different level. I, I don't see that be done in any place here on the newspaper, magazine, government, I still I don't understand how they want to make me feel more secure. Well, the only the things that I feel I see is they want to make me feel afraid all the time. Everybody is my enemy except the real enemy because I doesn't have a face. One thing. Another thing is the, the uh, credit card. I cannot use my credit card to get package at the post office, but I can use the credit card anywhere because it's an economical issue. They want to see where I go and what I buy. They don't let me go in the building with my credit card because they don't need to know that, but they need to know if I'm here or if I'm next door 
it, which kind of uh, uh, items I'm going to buy, or books, or stuff like that. Money opens a lot of doors. Yeah, it's all about money. But the, again, they sell it as a security issue, but it's totally an economical issue. Yeah, well, because I that's the way that they're going to build up database that they're going to use for different issues, not the security one. So, so I, I think that the, the economic analysis of security questions is, is very revealing. Um, I would encourage you to, to use it. And um, I feel that we are, I'm trying to hold you all against a coffee break. So if you have any more comments or questions, I'll be happy to stick around and talk. But thank you very much.